Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you all about detecting novel retrotransposon insertions using nanopore reads. So a bit of background about retrotransposons. Uh, retrotransposons are transposable elements that can amplify and insert themselves via an RNA intermediate and reverse transcription. They contain genes for replication and payload, and they account for a fairly large fraction of the human genome, about 42%. Uh, retrotransposon activity and their genomic reinsertion has previously been linked to cancer progression, and retrotransposons include um, different classes such as herbs, lines, signs, and SVAs, ranging in length from about 300 to 8,000 base pairs. Uh, the figure on the right shows the uh, normal retrotransposon transcription translation, reverse transcription, and integration method. Uh, the same retrotransposon sequence might be transcribed and translated in multiple cells, but the actual insert positions may differ. And <clears throat> the entire retrotransposon sequence may not necessarily reinsert itself back into the genome. So you have a, um, you might have a partial insertion that's shorter than the original sequence. The project that I'm going to talk to you all about today is a project done in collaboration with Daniel D. Carvalho's lab at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. They're investigating the effectiveness of cellular reverse transcriptase inhibitors. They took 11 samples from the BT16 cancer cell line, kept a single sample as an untreated control, and took the remaining 10 and treated them with a DNA damage inducer, EZH30, EZH2 inhibitor, UNC199. Uh, this was meant to activate retrotransposon activity. They then kept five samples aside uh, and took the other five samples and subsequently treated those with different reverse transcriptase inhibitors. All of these samples were then sequenced using an Oxford nanopore prometheon, giving us a mean read length of about 8,000 base pairs. So there are, there are variations in BT16 compared to the human reference genome. So BT16 contains copies of retrotransposons that are not found in the human reference genome. And when aligned reads that contain these copies will have insertions in them that we denote as polymorphic inserts. And we can see those highlighted in gray um, in the figure on the right. And the treatments that we applied to the, to the samples caused existing retrotransposons to activate and possibly reinsert new copies into the genome. And these new insertions are what we consider novel inserts. And I've shown those in blue on the right. Um, and these are what we're interested in. So uh, what we're interested in is quantifying exactly how many novel insertions from each type of retrotransposon repeat family there are in each of the treated samples. And some areas of the genome may be more likely to see novel retrotransposon inserts, and we call these areas hotspots. Now, the, the most sort of simplest way for detecting uh, retrotransposon insertions from long reads is just to use an existing long read structural variation caller. Uh, but we found that stru stru conventional structural variation detection methods need multiple reads to support an insert at a uh, specific sequence, at a specific position. And we can't always find novel insertions this way. Some of our novel inserts might occur in a single cell and thus yield us a single read. And because we don't do any form of amplification or PCR, uh, we're only going to have a single read. So we may be able to detect positions like the position on the top of the figure where we have multiple inserts at the same position, uh, multiple reads with inserts at the same position, but a single read with an insert at that position is not going to be detected with conventional S structural variation detection tools. So our goal was to be able to detect both inserts found in a single read of the positions as well as inserts that occur in multiple reads and then be able to distinguish between the two. To achieve this goal, we developed a novel detection pipeline to identify and filter retrotransposon insertions. This pipeline is designed to identify novel inserts using the untreated set as a control, and it's implemented in Python and SnakeMate and available online in GitHub. The first step of our pipeline is to align reads to the GRCH38 human reference genome. Uh, the pipeline is optimized to use WinOMAP2 as the aligner, but it will work with other long read aligners as well. Uh, once we've aligned reads to the reference, we parse these alignments to identify which reads actually support an insertion. The insertions themselves are identified from alignment cigar strings, where we extract the sequences of any insertion greater than 100 base pairs and on a read with an alignment mapping quality of at least 20. Large genomic inserts might not always be detected uh, in, in the alignments. We see from the figure shown here that there's a read with an insertion in it but it's not, it doesn't have a single alignment record. It's been split into two, one for an alignment of the sequence upstream of the insert and one for the alignment downstream of the insert. 
The two alignment portions are adjacent to one another on the reference, but there's a gap on the read where the insert sequence actually is. So we can take these two aligned uh, segments of the read and combine them together and recover the missed insertion, extracting the sequence the same way as before. Once we do have extracted uh, insertion sequences, we then pass these to the last aligner to align them to a set of human retrotransposon consensus sequences, allowing us to annotate inserts to the repeat, retrotransposon repeat family that they uh, map to the best. We then filter inserts uh, to identify mapping artifacts, which includes removing insertions that come from chimeric reads, as well as inserts that come from supplementary alignments of other insertion sequences. At this stage, we're left with a fairly high set a uh, fairly high quality set of insertions annotated to retrotransposon repeat family. Some of these are novel insertions and others are due to uh, variation between the cell line and the reference, i.e. polymorphic insertions. So the first step that we do to filter out polymorphic insertions is to use the untreated sample as a control for the variation between the cell line itself and the reference. We filter any insertions found in the treated samples within 1000 base pairs of an insertion found in the control sample. So looking at the figure, we can see position A, we see insertions at this position in the untreated control and the treated sample. These inserts are likely polymorphic insertions. While position B, we don't see anything in the untreated control, but we do see an insertion in the treated sample, meaning it's likely a novel insertion. Now, we might not always filter out all polymorphic inserts with the untreated control, and some genomic regions might be hotspots for novel inserts, as I mentioned before and where we can see multiple novel insertion events across multiple cells in the same region. So in order to distinguish between a region where we might see a few inserts that are polymorphic versus a few inserts that are hotspots, we use a haplotype-based filtering approach where we phase all of the reads and we look to, we look to find haplotype-specific insert patterns where we, we believe that a polymorphic insertion should take on a haplotype-specific insert pattern being either found in all the reads for both haplotypes or all the reads for one of the two haplotypes looked at. So in the figure here, position A, all of the inserts shown in gray are, are on the pink haplotype, while in position B, the, the, the insertions differ between the haplotypes, making it likely to be a hotspot, while position A being a missed polymorphic. And this brings me to the set of final calls. Um, once we've completed the, the pipeline, we should have a set of, of calls that represent uh, novel insertion events. So one of the inserts that I'm, I'm highlighting here is a just under 3,000 base pair line insert shown with the, the black box around it. Uh, this is in one of our treated samples on a position in chromosome 3. It's the only read uh, that has uh, an insertion at this position. And it's a partial line insertion, meaning it's not the full 6,000 base pair line sequence, so just 3,000 base pairs of line, but it is an insert uh, that we were able to detect with our pipeline that we wouldn't have been able to detect if we just used conventional structural variation detection methods. Looking over all of our treated samples, we detect uh, in novel insertions for uh, the four repeat families that I mentioned uh, before, and we normalized the, uh, the insert counts by the number of million mapped reads for each family and for each, um, for each sample. Uh, and these are results that we generated using WinnowMap2 as our aligner. This then brings me to the, this bring, brings up the need to validate the effectiveness of our pipeline. So one of the things we looked at was validating the polymorphic uh, calls that we're making and our haplotype specific approach for detecting uh, polymorphic insertions. So we decided to use reads uh, from ONT samples of genome in a bottles HG002. Uh, and we chose this because HG002 is well studied and it is, it's a normal, uh, it's a normal um, genome, meaning we don't expect there to be any novel insertions between samples, but we do expect there to be variation between HG002 and the reference genome, allowing us to call polymorphic insertions. So we selected one of the uh, ONT samples as a, a single replicate to act as our control, and we then selected the remaining uh, samples to act as our test. We ran the pipeline this way and compared our polymorphic calls to those found in genome in a bottle's curated SV set for HG002, plus those calls with sniffles using PacBio HiFi reads from the same genome. What we found was for small retrotransposons, we see a fairly high concordance with the curated SV set, about 96 to 98%. But for larger retrotransposons, those of line and herbs, 
uh, we see that there's a bit of a difference between 76 to 86 percent of, of our calls are, are shared. And this most likely is due to the alignment position differing, with larger insertions having less flanking sequence for the aligner to map uh, to the uh, correct position in the genome. This, uh, the next thing that we uh, looked at was validating our calls with assembly graphs. And this is a method currently in development. So we're currently developing a, a way to validate our calls in the treated samples by generating an assembly graph using short alumina reads of a single, of a single untreated control. What we would do here is we would align reads from the treated samples to this graph using a tool such as graph aligner, and we would parse these alignments. And ideally reads that support a polymorphic insertion should align end to end, while reads that support a novel insertion should be broken at the position of the novel insertion. So visually, we can see a read that does not support an insertion should have a single alignment through the graph. And similarly, a read that supports a polymorphic insertion should also have just a single alignment through the graph, as the polymorphic insert sequence should be found in the untreated control and thus be present in the graph. However, a novel insertion should be broken at the, uh, should have a broken alignment where the break is right at the insert position because that insert sequence is not present in the graph of the untreated control. Uh, and lastly, this brings me to future work. So we're currently in the process of validating the pipeline's polymorphic calls with this graph-based approach, but we're also looking at validating the novel calls we make and the detection method using barcoded sequences inserted with TN5. And we can quantify exactly how many detected insertions are novel versus uh, false positives this way. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to me talk today. I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Jared Simpson, and the rest of the Simpson Lab, as well as Dr. Daniel D. Carvalho and Frank uh, for all of their, their help and support in this project. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll take questions.